Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, politics is exciting. The Biden administration plans to end the coronavirus public health emergency in May. So, uh, I can understand, you know, got to change the finances of this and that. It's going to limit the number of free tests that they provide in tests. But the bill that the Republicans are sponsoring is called, and I love this, the Pandemic is Over Act. So, what I love about this is declaring that the pandemic is over does not make it over. So, I understand the, the political reasons why and the financial reasons why the country has to move up beyond the current stage, but let's not pretend the pandemic is over because when we start pretending that, then new variants will crop up and come get us. So, just, this is like a infectious disease, public health 101. Just go back and remember, we went through this in the beginning, but an endemic inf infection or what's endemic is, you know, belongs, it sort of, it lives in, within the country and people, you know, a, a local region, uh, you know, and so if you have an outbreak, that's a number of cases that are either above the endemic level or in the case of something like Ebola just shows up as a case. Epidemics are those things that affect large numbers of people and communities in a region, a population region, like an epidemic in the United States or an epidemic in Africa. <laughs> a pandemic is something that spreads to multiple countries and, and, and uh, continents. So <laughs> let's go to the map. I feel like Vanna White here. Let's go to the map. This is a map of current outbreaks of the cases. And, you know, I know you all remember this. There are seven continents. Asia, Africa, Australia, Europe, North America, South America, all still have significant amounts of cases. The only continent not involved still is Antarctica, and I'm sure that the penguins have got something to do with that. But, you know, we, this by any definition is evidence that the global pandemic is still raging, although, you know, we're doing better with it. We're, we're having more immunity, so eventually it might not be a pandemic, but it certainly isn't one because... A bill that's submitted uh, is, is, is got the name of it as the end of the pandemic. Anyway, mostly good news. Uh, so that's always fun. Uh, the best news is I, I recently had a febrile illness, had a fever, and I, I tested for COVID, was negative, tested for flu, was negative, for RSV, negative. And then a whole bunch of my friends and people in the office have gotten infected. They're <laughs> COVID negative, flu negative. So it looks like we're back to almost normal where you just get some sort of virus and feel bad, but it's not COVID or flu or RSV. So that's that's good. And and there's good evidence for that. If you look at case number in the U.S., pretty flat, actually even coming down. In uh, If you look at the heat map, it's a little subtle, but this was where we were in November, almost nothing in no, in the fall of 2022. We had a sort of a increase in the northeast and southeast, and now it's beginning to come down, definitely coming down in the northeast and subtly coming down in, this, in the southeast. And if you look at uh, number of patients hospitalized, really dropping significantly uh, in overall cases and also those over the age of 70. <laughs> Our friends in Dimmick County are doing great. Again, another week with no admissions. Harris County is a moderate risk, but coming down. So uh, we've had uh, 76 per 100,000, still pretty good, and uh, 10 admissions per 100,000. That's in the moderate range of the, by the CDC definition, but that's all very good. And of course, we love our TMC data because it's the best. Looks like the number of people who are positive has come down. That it was, re, you know, the peak was about 11 percent a few weeks ago. Now it's down to 7 percent. Hospitalizations are down, not quite under 100 yet, 125 per day. So that's good. I mean, it's not, it's not insignificant. It's 125 missions a day for a week, but it's still. Uh, better than it was. And the best indicator, of course, is wastewater beginning to come down. Now, a real interesting phenomenon uh, related to deaths. So if you look at deaths uh, nationally, I, if I've talked about this as a lagging indicator because people get the disease, they, if they're really sick, they get hospitalized, and if it's a real problem, they, they pass away from the disease. It's coming down slowly. But this is one of the most fascinating things, pieces of data I've seen in a while. If you look at mortality, by age group over the, the lifespan of this pandemic. Look at that, huge peak 
it, with the original Wuhan in Italy strains, or the ones identified in Wuhan in Italy and then came to the U.S., and, you know, really in the 70-year-olds, I mean, just tremendous mortality in the beginning. Then with each peak, you could see this huge amount, of, this peak of mortality, mostly in 65 and over and 75 and over, but with every peak, we had a peak in mortality. So alpha strain, the delta, Omicron came, and now, even though these are further variants of Omicron, you can see very low. We haven't really had a big peak. So that suggests one of two things. Either we're finally getting sort of more uh, uh, national uh, immunity because people have either been infected or vaccinated, or the virus itself is evolving into a less virulent uh, virus. And that, that is fairly common. What are you eating, Miss Lily? Oh, cheese. She, Miss Lily's eating part of the presentation. <laughs> When you know it's the wastewater, <laughs> Lily, really stay out of the wastewater. Jeez. Anyway, Lily. Anyway, it's very interesting because it really kind of suggests that we are finally achieving sort of lo broader level of immunity. So here's a here's a really good example. If you look at the data, 73 percent of the population over the age of five uh, has now gotten at least a primary series of vaccination, and about a third of the population probably much more than that, but a third of the population that we know of has been infected. You know, so almost 100%, you know, there's a lot of overlap, so it's not 100%, but, you know, 95% of the population has either had a vaccine or been infected or both. And so that provides a lot of immunity, which is one of the reasons why I think we're not saying the mortality values. But you notice I say over the age of five, because under the age of five still is a problem, which we'll talk about. And here's a good example of the differences in behavior over the age of 65, most of the people have vaccine-induced immunity, smaller vaccine and infection. Between 18 and 65, mostly it was because they either got infected uh, or infected and vaccinated. So it, once again, proving that people over the age of 65 are smarter because they got vaccinated. Just saying. <laughs> There's an advantage to getting older. Apparently, you realize that you've got to survive to get vaccinated. But here's the problem. The problem is kids. So worldwide, 50 to 70% of children are still susceptible. These are the susceptible graphs uh, to uh, infection. And so these are areas in the world where kids have not either been infected or vaccinated. And if you look in the US, it's really striking. Between the age of two and four, 90% of the kids are unvaccinated. Parents, between the age of two, two and four, your kids are not getting vaccinated. And under the age of two, 93% are unvaccinated. So they are tremendously susceptible. Remember, we talked about what fuels ongoing infection. It's who's ever susceptible. And the virus doesn't care what age you are. It just it cares whether you're a host. So a lot of this is now being driven by kids under the age of five. Is there evidence for that? Well, look at this. This is a, a study, National Syndrome Surveillance Program, that looks at who shows up with the respiratory uh, symptoms and who's COVID positive. During the alpha wave, well, that was all 75 year olds because we didn't have vaccinations. Uh, people that were very susceptible, huge. So most of the time when a 75 year old showed up with those symptoms of a respiratory illness, it was COVID. If you look now, who is it mostly? Two, under the age of two for Omicron and look at these peaks for eight, two and under. So. To, under the age of five still is a big reservoir for uh, susceptible kids. And as long as they're susceptible hosts, the virus will continue to replicate. It's going to happen in susceptible individuals, which are now kids all over the world, and also in places where they haven't been infected. Another piece of good news, though, is that among the folks who've had COVID, the long COVID uh, incidence seems to be declining. So. Back in June of 2022, one in five people had symptoms for long COVID, and that has declined to about 10%, so uh, one in 10. So it's almost halved, and you can see in general just whether you, you know, have symptoms or, uh, or not, the incidence of, um, of long COVID is declining. Again, probably because of, you know, the immunity that we're developing. So I want to end up with a bunch of shout outs this week. First, uh, to, uh, Dr. Lynn Ziedrich, a professor who works in the field of DNA topology, has been elected into the newest class of fellows of the American Association for the Advance Advancement of Science. So congratulations, uh, Dr. Ziedrich. 
uh, and our, friend, our friends in Dimmick County. We follow anything that's going on in Dimmick County. I want to congratulate all the students who participate in the Dimmick County Junior Livestock Show. You know, it's getting to be rodeo season, and the students dedicated a lot of time to raising their animals in preparation for the livestock show. And of course, we're all excited about the rodeo coming up here in Houston. And then, of course, today is National Wear Red Day. Uh, this is in support of the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women campaign. Notice I'm wearing my pin. And Lily has her red scarf on. So we're all ready to uh, thank all the physicians and researchers who are trying to solve all the problems of uh, women who get cardiovascular disease. So Lily and I are excited and we're supporting it all the way. And of course, Louie had a very successful visit uh, to Houston and Lily had a wonderful time posting him. So uh, it was really great and despite the weather, I hope you all have a great uh, weekend and I can't wait to see you next week.